Now, last Friday, the Supreme Court of Nigeria dealt a major blow to a signature agenda of President Muhammadu Buhari when it shot down Executive Order No. 10, ceding financial autonomy to state legislature and judiciary. The Apex Court held that the Executive Order No. 10 was inconsistent with the 1999 Constitution and therefore unconstitutional, illegal, null and void, and of no effect whatsoever. Well, joining us to break this down is head attorney of Liboris Oshoma Chambers, Liboris Oshoma. Thank you very much, Mr. Oshoma, for joining us. Yeah, thank you, my, my, my sister. <laughs> Great. Um, let's, a lot of people do not necessarily understand the nitty-gritty of the executive order number 10. So let's lay a basis, a foundation for it, and why Mr. President had to yeah. go this route. Yeah, um, if you remember section 121, subsection 3, um, um, uh, empowers the state legislature and um, the judiciary, the revenue, revenue that accrues to the state legislature and the judiciary to be charged directly to um, those um, arms of government. But unfortunately, um, that had not been so, as the section had been largely obeyed in breach by the state governors. So, um, sometimes in 2021, the, just, the Judicial Union of um, um, Nigeria, uh, Judicial Focus Union of Nigeria, went on strike uh, for about um, 80 days or so, and then in um, an attempt to resolve that issue, the president um, signed executive order number 10 to instruct the auditor general to uh, withhold funds meant for uh, state government that refused to comply with section 121, subsection 3, which uh, uh, states that uh, revenue that accrues to state legislature and um, judiciary should be charged directly to them. And, and so the governors went to court in one breath. The governors were requesting that that was a travail the pass of the uh, president. In another breath, asking the, the president and the, asking the court to order the government to pay them, I think about, um, was it 600 billion or so, that they have spent on a capital project for state judiciary. And so what the court simply said was, well, why? The executive order number 10 is a traverse the constitution, uh, the powers of the president, because it amounts to amending section 121, subsection 3, also that you cannot deny the fact that the state judiciary are actually owned by the state. So any money expended by the state governor should not be refunded to them by the federal government. Hmm. That's basically the nature of the retirement. Now, a lot of people would say or refer to what the, the, the Supreme Court has done as a win for the governors. In fact, they, the governors may even be rejoicing. Uh, but in reality, is this a win for the governors? Because, again, um, this has, the issue of autonomy for both the legislature and even local governments has been a front burner issue. We keep talking about it year in, year out. But the, governor, the governments or the governors of these states continuously hold on to those finances. And the question is, really, why? Yeah, um, while Executive Order Number 10 was a good law, but also we should not forget that um, if um, such laws are allowed to stand and you have a dictator for a president, it might resort to the usage of executive orders to circumvent the provisions of the Constitution. And, and so that's why, for me, um, I would rather not say it's a win for the uh, state governors, but rather a win for the Nigerian people that the Supreme Court stood firmly behind the letters and spirit of the Constitution. So what, you know, the responsibility is now on the rest of us to ensure that the autonomy uh, guaranteed by the Constitution to the judiciary and the state legislature should indeed be upheld. I had uh, consistently charged the MBA, uh, MBA in the short term to request for interpretation of the Constitution and um, on that section and also push for my amendment of that section 121 to include a proviso, a penalty clause for state governors that refuse 
to comply with uh, the sections empowering autonomy for state legislature and the judiciary. Because really, if you not have, if we do not have an autom autonomous legislative arm of government, like we do at the center, it will be uh, uh, um, a, a way of kissing goodbye to our, our democracy, a fledging democracy. Because if you have, as we speak currently, the local governments are most non-existent. And so if you have um, state legislature that are still, you know, under the April string of the uh, state executive, and then they will have to put to the state executive in everything that they do, then it truly means that democracy is our uh, democracy is at stake. Mm. And then uh, it behoves of all of us, every hand must be on deck to ensure that, you know, um, the autonomy, financial autonomy granted those arm of government is strictly complied with. And that's why for me also, I think we should consistently look at um, uh, our electoral, election and electionary mode to have a transparent process where the governors will not act as uh, emperors or behemoths like we see them do, where state uh, funds meant for other arm of government um, uh, in their states are consistently held on to. Hmm. Uh, someone asked a question uh, s some time ago that, you know, if these people are at the whims and caprices uh, of, of the governors of the state and this has now happened, how do these workers, in especially the legislative workers, seek redress? Because, again, <laughs> they need, like you have said, some form of autonomy. So what's next? Other than us saying, let's wait for the elections how else do we deal with this issue? Or is it just going to become another local government autonomy issue that's just there, uh, you know, somewhere? Yeah, uh, that's why for me, I, like I said consistently, it is um, not something we all should just um, gloss over or, or go to sleep because the Supreme Court has said, look, rightly so, uh, executive order number 10, uh, uh, the president, you don't have the powers to use executive orders to amend or add to the sections of the constitution. What we should now do, what the president attempted, though, to correct that anomaly, what the rest of us should now do, including, uh, look, let me tell you, if not for that Joseph strike, the executive number, order number 10 would have come into being. So I would also urge members of um, the workers at um, the state's um, legislative uh, uh, offices, including Joseph also, to go back and down to the moment they incapacitate both the legislative state legislatures and um, the uh, judiciary. state judiciary, the governors will have no other option but to sit down and ensure and insist that they all comply with um, uh, the uh, uh, section 121 sub 3. And then also, I want to challenge the bodies of uh, uh, state uh, House of Assembly speakers. I, I, I expect that when they meet at that level, this should be an opportunity, this should be a heated topic for them also to rub minds on and insist that they remain on the corner. It's not something we should all gloss over. Because I can imagine, just imagine that um, funds made for the state governors are withheld by the president, which mm. is who want them to cut on the first place. You know, the way things are presently, it is difficult for the state of assembly to even challenge their governors because you know, they are I was about to say that state. because most of these legislatures that we have in states are almost rubber stamped. So who's going to call up the governor and say, we need these monies released? I mean, it's going to continue as a vicious cycle if something doesn't give. It is, it is the rest of us. You know, so let, let me tell you, you and I are members of the civil society. All of us, it is those of us that this thing affects not necessarily the people who are benefiting it from it financially, but the rest of us that insist on, on good governance, rule of law, and transparency, because we are the ones that will benefit in the long run. It is beholds on the rest of us to insist. If, look, let me tell you one thing. These governors are afraid of us as a people. When we keep quiet, they think that um, uh, all is well. But when we consistently talk about these things and keep them in the fourth corner, it also pushes them back to insist, to also want to implement this section of the Constitution. It is a, 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 an impossibility for the State House of Assembly to insist on the um, uh, autonomy, uh, execution of autonomy for Houses of Assembly. They cannot achieve it. It is we, the ordinary people, and in some cases, the workers in the Assembly, and then the workers in the courts that should be able, that would be able 
to insist on the, the, the compliance with our provisions of the Constitution. And that's how democracy develops. Because if we, the rest of us, sit down and say, because it doesn't affect us, and so we are not going to fight for that cause, gradually our laws will be observed and breached. This is a section of the Constitution that is being violated with impunity by state governors, and they still want House of Assembly to come cap in hand, begging for budgets, begging for uh, uh, funds, meant for uh, the, the running, smooth running of the uh, legislative arm of government. And what that means is that the governors have consistently violated our laws with impunity, and with the rest of us, quietly, you know, just keep quiet and uh, do nothing about it. This is the government that is closest to us. And it is because of on us now, now that the court has said, look, Mr. President, you do not have the powers to amend the constitution, you know, by executive orders, you can do something else. It now behoves on us to go back as civil societies, as members of trade union, to go back and insist that our governors cannot be higher than our laws. Our okay. governors are not superior to our laws. Because if we allow it today, tomorrow, it might be something worse. The governors can even withhold salaries and allowances. Already they are withholding salaries and allowances of the ordinary workers. Mm. To the extent that now that when state government pays salaries, they are to celebrated as an achievement. Before you know it, they are testing the water gradually with one feet. If they can withhold salaries, and now they are withholding finances meant for state reserve assembly, meant for judiciary. Before you know it, the rest of us, the government can just sit down the budget and say there is no money, so it will, it's, it's not going to pass the budget. Is uh, it that, at that time that we will wake up? Even as I speak to you, the local government of uh, 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 the council is almost non-existent. The state governments have made it court matters that, in some cases, they appoint uh, uh, administrators, sole administrators, to overrun the affairs of state uh, local government in places where this, uh, this, uh, 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 the constitution has guaranteed a democratically elected government at the local level. It's because we are out quiet. We are quiet on our rights. Mm. So do we see a, a hashtag Occupy Government House anytime soon in different states? But then I would like to ask, are there any states that have complied with this section of the Constitution to make sure that monies are released to the um, you know, um, legislatures? I'm wondering, are there any states that no. other states could no. emulate? None, none, none so far. Absolutely none. So none. Far. When it comes to these issues, they, 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 they are all uniform. They are all unanimous. So no, no state, no state has granted autonomy to state House of Assembly. You see them running back to the governors as if um, they are they are beggars to the executive. And and, and, and it is it is bad. It's very dangerous for our democracy. It is not something you know the rest of us should should encourage. They were elected the same way that the state governor is elected. And, and so they even though uh, the state governor heads the way the state governor heads. The executive arm is the same way the speaker of the house of assembly heads the legislative arm and you know even though the state governor carries the burden of the government but then he shouldn't treat other uh, arms of government as though they are subservient to the executive or that they are servants to the executive it's because the rest of us allowed it hmm. Well, I want to say thank you. Liberos Oshoma is the lead attorney at Liberos Oshoma Chambers. Thank you so much for speaking with us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Well, we want to thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, I will give you my take. Here's my take. Now, there are some who agree with the principle behind the executive order number 10 signed by the president, but... There are also contending issues. The provision which empowers the Accountant General of the Federation to authorize the deduction from source is in the course of the Federation account. Allocation from the monies allocated to any state of the Federation that fails to release allocation meant for the state legislature and the state judiciary in line with the financial autonomy guaranteed by Section 12, Subsection 3 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended, which we can say is contentious. But I'm thinking that in a country where the rule of law is supreme, there would have been no need whatsoever for an executive order to compel our governors to comply with the constitution that they swore to uphold. So if the governors can blatantly refuse to obey the constitution as, as it is the case on this issue, how will these affected people seek redress?
I really hope, if you ask me, that governors will not see this judgment as a victory for their lawlessness. We must keep this conversation alive. The law should and must apply to all and not some. I mean, our leaders can't keep picking and choosing the laws that they want to obey and the ones that they want to discard. I look forward to a time when accountability will be the watchword of Nigeria's leaders. Maybe then, just maybe then, Nigeria can truly work. I'm Mary Anakom, but before I leave you, I'd like to let you know what uh, Nigerians are reacting to in terms of the government's plan, the federal government's plan, uh, to an importing uh, imported bad fuel. Uh, let's take a look, but have a good evening. Well, the country needs fixing itself. So if they're using 200 and whatever billion to fix dirty fuel, how did it get into the country, number one? How did they do? They are, not make, they are not giving us names. To start with, they are not giving us names. Who imported those fuel into the country? How did the fuel? And so, why, how are they, they knowing what they want to fix? They should just tell us that they want to use the, on, on this money for another corruption deal. And after they will tell us that, oh, they are probing these people. See, Nigerians, we are not, we are tired of all these people. We are tired of this government. That is why we need to come out and vote the right person this time around. Thank you. Number one, our country is corrupt. So now what are we going to do about the corruption? We need to fight the corruption because from the top, the corruption started. So where then you are crying for the fair problem, I don't see anything big deal because say no. You know, when a time an election like this, you must have one thing for this country to hold it on it, to make sure say they're going to take that one to punish other people. There are so many other things the federal government can do. I think the marketer who brought the, the contaminated fuel to the country, they are still there. They are the people that are supposed to be responsible for all this cleaning. Even all the engine that this adulterated fuel has spoiled, it is marketers, it is people. Whether it is NNPC or marketers, private markets that brought the, the fuel to the country, these are the people that are supposed to clean all those things. The, the, the 200 billion, 201 billion naira the federal government said they want to use for this now, I don't think there's any, doesn't, I don't think it makes any sense. Okay, the federal government, using the sum of, uh, using the sum of 201 billion naira to clean up the, the dirty fuel importation, to me is a fraud. It's a fraud. It's a kind of trying to, to monopolize the oil, the, the, the oil se sector. It's a good thing. I support that government, but that money, say they go take and do that thing. Nobody say they don't talk and now. They go see what they take and do. Because it's, they want to go, they want to do them. It's good.